Now, there is nothing quite like a countdown, the countdown clock, to raise the sense of tension in the room, the tension level. And uh, I might literally run out of, me- uh, out of time during this message. It's ticking away. And if that's the case, we're just, fold up your Bible, we're done. And, you know, I almost feel like the sand's going too quick. Uh, check. You know, it's a funny one. We often use things like watches, cell phone, alarm clocks, and, and we keep track of the time. We think about time, but we often don't think about time like this. Time running away, time disappearing. We often think about time like how much time till the next thing or that next event we're looking forward to. But as we measure time and as we see it in our life, we don't always think about it as disappearing, that sand that's getting to the bottom half of the glass. And sometimes watching time disappear, the seconds tick by, that countdown creates this uncomfortable tension in our life. Because the most valuable resource we have been entrusted with is time. Time. In fact, in ancient times, in biblical times, they, they literally measured money by time. Money and time were very closely connected. So a denarius, uh, a silver coin, was valued at one day's unskilled labor. One day's work was a denarius. The money and the time were closely linked Now, we've been in this series called Wise Management that we started last week, and being a wise manager involves learning how to to, to skillfully manage our treasures and, and our skills and abilities, our talents, but it also has to do with being able to manage our time knowing how to manage our time. And this morning, we're focused on time. It's that clock's been running the whole service. And last week we learned how a wise manager, one of the important things about a wise manager is we have all been entrusted by Jesus as as his representatives, responsible uh, over various different talents, different things he's placed in our life, responsibilities. And he wants us to be prepared for his return. The, The clock is running on his return. And last week I also mentioned how about a third of Jesus' parables that he gives, his parables are, a third of them are about wise management, the principles of wise management. That's a ton. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at another one of those parables that Jesus gives. Last week we looked at a parable. This week we're looking at another parable about wise management that Jesus gives from Luke chapter 16. You can start turning there, getting ready. And this parable is called the parable of the shrewd manager. The parable of the shrewd manager. And the word shrewd, right, it means prudent, it means wise. So this is literally the parable about the wise manager. Like, awesome, that's like the series, like, here we go, here's our parable. But get ready, because this is one of Jesus' most confusing parables. It catches us totally off guard, because this parable of the shrewd manager, this wise manager, uh, this manager in the parable is totally dishonest. Uh, This parable is about a manager who lies, cheats, and is a scoundrel. Um, And this manager in this parable is about to be fired because he's such a dishonest manager. And yet this parable will commend, the master will come and commend this, this manager as being shrewd, wise, And so we kind of go, what in the world is happening? This is a really confusing passage of scripture. Is this parable, like, is Jesus trying to tell us to, like, lie, cheat, and steal? Like, what's happening in this parable exactly? So get ready, because this is one of Jesus' most confusing parables. If not, perhaps the most confusing parable in the Gospels. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to read our parable together. This parable of the the shrewd manager. And then we're going to try to get unconfused. Get unconfused. That's our goal after we read it, right? Try to understand what's happening in this parable, what it's actually saying, so that we can discover the point of this parable. Read it, get unconfused, 
discover the point. So let's read the passage together and get started. Luke chapter 16, picking up in verse 1. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each of his master's debtors and he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, holy, a thousand bushels of wheat, a ton, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with dealing with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Now, I'll be honest, read through the Gospel of Luke a bunch of times growing up, but I never really understood this parable for the longest time. It was always kind of an enigma. What exactly is happening? So if you're a bit confused right now, right, totally understandable, because the manager in this parable, well, we just read the manager commits fraud, right? He commits fraud, but then gets commended by his master, like, good job? What is happening in this passage exactly? What is this about? It's time to get unconfused. Let's try to get unconfused about this parable. And on first glance, it seems like, it appears as if the master is commending the manager for being dishonest. But that doesn't quite make sense. Because this this parable starts in verses 1 and 2 with the master punishing, firing the manager the, uh, for being dishonest. And this passage almost seems to not quite add up, right? If the master is commending the manager for being dishonest, well then the concluding statements are almost a contradiction. They're saying the opposite message, right? Verse 10 and 12 through 12 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you have not been trustworthy with dealing with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? This is one of the most confusing parables, these mixed messages, like what is happening here? Well, the first thing we recognize is that this parable is not commending the why, this manager for being dishonest. He's not saying, oh, you were shrewd for being dishonest. He's commending him for something else. Hmm. Now to understand what it is that's shrewd, what it is that's wise that this manager is doing, we need to understand this particular style of teaching that Jesus is using in this passage. The style of the argument he's making. Because that's where some of that confusion lies. And in this passage, Jesus is using this style of argument called, how much more? How much more? Jesus has lots of teaching that uses this how much more style of argument. Uh, and there's many examples that literally use that phrase. That's why we call it this how much more kind of argument. But not all of them use that phrase, like this passage. Here's an example. An example to kind of help us figure out 
Like, what is Jesus arguing here? Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 through 11, Jesus says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, if you read this passage and think to yourself, wait, is Jesus telling parents to give their kids stones and snakes? Is he encouraging that? No, that's not the point of it. We recognize it. This style of argument that he's saying is basically that if an evil person understands something, how much more should a righteous person understand it? If an evil person understands, how much more should a righteous person understand? Now, looking at that that commendation that the master gives. Verse 8, we'll read it again. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. See, if an evil person understands, then how much more should a righteous person understand? If, if a dishonest, evil manager understands that their time is limited, that this grains of sand are slowly disappearing, and so they, they get busy investing into their future, if an evil manager understands, how much more should a righteous one understand? A righteous person understand. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, when the last little bits fall to the ground, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now this parable of the shrewd manager sort of slaps you in the face a bit. Uh, and 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 it hits us in a weird way because even the terrible steward This wicked man, right? He's commended for recognizing that his time is short, limited. And knowing, not only that, but knowing to invest into relationships with people, into his future. How much more should the people of the light be shrewd managers? We have discovered, we have stumbled upon the point of this passage. The point of this passage. There's two key observations we can make about this passage that we can learn from it and glean from it. And the first one is that wise stewards, wise managers, they recognize that our time is limited. Wise managers recognize that, man, that sand at the bottom, I can't get that back. My time, seconds ticking away. You know, August was a strange month for me, this last August, last month. Um, I usually do four funerals or so an entire year. And in August... I had four funerals in, in, the, in that month alone here at the church. And it felt like every single week there was a funeral. Uh, and by that fourth funeral of the month, it, it kind of starts to impact you. When you're going to a funeral every single week, in and out, it hits you. And there's this realization that I'm not going to be here forever. Like one day, this is, it, it'll be my funeral. And when it's especially a service that you're attending for someone who's around your own age, it, it becomes even more intense, even more real. Like, wow, my life, my life is like this hourglass. And the sand goes to the bottom and I can't get it back. You know, the most valuable resource we have that we have been entrusted with time. Time. And our time is limited. Sometimes when we're young, we don't even, it feels like forever. It feels so far off. 
In fact, for some of us, uh, we won't even recognize that our time is limited. It won't even cross our horizon until all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we look down at the hourglass, hourglass of our life and we realize that it's over half gone. That the amount of sand at the bottom is more than the sand at the top. We panic. We start to get anxious. And we go out and buy a motorcycle or a Mustang, right? Like <laughs> a midlife crisis. We know this moment. It happens so frequently when, oh my goodness, it's over half gone. Like, what have I been doing? I've been a fool. I thought my money and my abilities were the most important thing I had, but it was always my time. It was always my time. There's prayers in the Bible, the Psalms, and this one in particular always comes to mind. It's, per, it's got this poignancy to it. It's Psalm 90 verse 12. And it teaches us one of the things to be praying about. It says, teach us to number our days. Teach me to number my days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom. See, wise stewards, this first big observation that we recognize from this parable, wise stewards recognize that our time is limited. And sometimes that's a bittersweet observation. Sometimes it's much easier, like ignorance is bliss. Just don't think about it. Just don't look down. Don't look down. Sometimes we don't like recognizing that fact. You know, parents think about myself and my own daughters. I have limited time to minister to my kids. It's an hourglass, just like that. Students, man, being a student, it feels like it's going to go forever. It's like, oh man, I've been in school forever. But students, your time is limited to minister to your friends. Employees. We have limited time to minister to coworkers. I know for some, it's hard to think about. Mine layoffs this last week. Some that time, you know, is limited to seize those opportunities to have conversations, to settle some unfinished business with a friend. You know, we gave those challenge cards last week with the parable of the talents and we entrusted you with resources to be investing into the kingdom of God, to be blessing neighbors with. And we've got that little pin board on the back wall of the gym and cards are starting to come in, reports, that card. Um, but you know, one of the feedbacks I got from that that people did not like, they said, I don't know why you did that. I'm not, not a fan. Number one complaint, we put a deadline. We put, it, we put a limit. Said you have to get these in by the 29th. You've been entrusted and there's a deadline. And the feedback, like, I don't like that. Why? I need some more time. I'm feeling pressure. I'm feeling... You know, we put that deadline on there exactly for this illustration. This point. Being a wise manager re is, is recognizing that our time is limited, that we have limited time, and sometimes that's the most valuable resource we have to invest. Verse 3 said, The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. My time is limited. Even the, the wicked steward, wrecked. I've got limited time left. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to, to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. This leads us to the second key observation, the point to this parable. Wise stewards know how to invest for tomorrow. Know how to invest into the future. Wise stewards know how to invest for tomorrow. Now I mentioned I had four funerals last month. And that is a lot of funerals. 
And I remember sitting in some of these rows during that, those funerals and there was opportunities to hear about the lives of the people and the great things they had done, the achievements. And I remember listening to some of those stories and sometimes when you hear about the achievements and the things that people do with their life, they can be amazing, but they are also sometimes a bit bittersweet. Because in our life, we can, we can invest in things. We can invest in the things that are not eternal. We can work, 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 work to reach new heights in our career. We can have beautiful lawns. We can work to collect things. We can start collecting even trophies and awards. There's nothing wrong with careers and trophies and lawns as long as we recognize that they're not eternal. They're not eternal. I can't remember when I saw this, and I've shared it before and a while back, but whenever I think about trophies, especially if someone gives me a trophy, this, this kind of morbid picture comes to mind, and I've never been able to shake it. And it was this scene that I'll never forget. It was, it was when there was a 40-yard dumpster that was backed up the driveway at a house of someone who had just, just died, passed. And uh, out in the yard, there they are, and they're working, kind of cleaning out that person's house. And this person had, had done incredible things in their life, had gotten tons of awards. They had a giant trophy case. And they, you know, first place at the marathon, or uh, most valuable employee, most improved bowler, rookie of the year, all these awards, trophies, medals, And I remember they were cleaning out the house. They were taking those trophies, just chucking them into that 40-yard dumpster. And it always struck me, <laughs> right? Whenever I get an award, even when I'm like, oh man, that will be my trophies one day. That'll be my trophies. That'll be my my hunting gear one day. That'll be my stuff one day getting chucked into that 40-yard dumpster, right? And, and I can try to make my children promise. I can, I can talk to Elizabeth and say, Elizabeth, promise me you'll never throw away my hunting gear. Save it forever, right? I, I can't take this with me, but you can't throw it away. You know, even if I did that, I'm not that naive. I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. It'll just be the grandkids one day who will be laughing at crazy grandpa who, you know, all this stuff. Why did he leave all this stuff? We can't even sell it at the garage sale. Chuck it in the dumpster. Wise stewards recognize two things. Our time here is limited. It's ebbing away. The second thing they recognize is how to invest for tomorrow. How to take what they've been given today and invest it into the future. Wise stewards know how to invest into eternal things. Things that won't end up in a dumpster. Lasting things. In fact, in verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd, wise in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, when the last little bit falls to the bottom, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. We recognize that we can't take a bag of gold with us to heaven, right? That stays here. But we can bring relationships. Relationships. Really, the only thing that you can invest in today and, and experience, enjoy for all of eternity is your relationship with God and others. In fact, it's sort of funny when Jesus is asked about what must I do? Like, what are the greatest commandments in Scripture? 
He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two things. Love God. Love neighbors. Wise stewards know how to invest for tomorrow. They do that. They do that by investing into the relationships they have with others and into their relationship with God. It's almost as if right now, in this moment, in this room, wherever you are at in life, we are, we are in a training regiment. We're training. We're getting ready. We're learning how to be wise managers because God has given to us time. And for some of us who are blessed, it'll be 80, 90 years, maybe a few more. You know, for others, it's going to be less. Just like last week's parable, the talents. God doesn't give everyone the same amount of talents, the same resources to be investing. But we can be training. We can be getting ready. We can be investing into eternal life. Learning how to invest our time wisely. Learning how to invest in eternal things. Because Jesus has in, entrusted to us, he's, he's offered to us eternal life. Eternal life. Wow. You know, if time is associated with, with money, a denarius was a day's worth of work, how much is eternal life worth? How many days of work is that? See, jo Jesus has, has offered to us real riches, true riches. Verse 10, he said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? You know, we're running out of time. It's ticking away. It's a good illustration of our life. Many of the good things we want to do with our life, vacations to go on, places to visit, being a wise manager of our resources that we've been entrusted with, it begins by recognizing, as Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on this earth. Do not pour everything into that moment where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break up and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Final story. Now those four funerals last month. One of those funerals was for a gal who came to the church here. And she had talked about how God had been prompting her. That God had been putting a burden on her heart to go and talk with her family about Jesus. To have that comfort, like, where are you at with Jesus? I just need to make sure you know And she was feeling like that time, like this, this is the moment. I really need to do this, to have that conversation. And we know, all know how hard that can be sometimes. Sometimes having that conversation with people close to us is like overwhelming. It's scary. We wrestle with how to have that conversation. How do we even start it? Do I write a letter perhaps? Do I just try a phone call? Do I just go for it? What do I say? And then it came as a shock. Shock to me. Totally blindsided. Because all of a sudden she died. And I had just talked with her. Like the week before. 
at her service last month. The final act of that service, I stood right here, and her family sat right there. We shared with her family members about Jesus. But I want you to recognize that we don't always get that second opportunity. All too often, when we look at our hourglass, the time we have is the time we have. It's the only time we have. It's perhaps an uncomfortable ending to a message. Watching the final seconds of our time ticking away. But I would challenge you, take strategic advantage of today. Take advantage of this week ahead. Take advantage if God is prompting you to invest in having that conversation with a friend. Take advantage if God is prompting you to invest in in helping that neighbor in need. I'll challenge you to be shrewd, to be a wise manager. Do not delay doing good. Don't delay doing good. Don't delay investing in those eternal moments, those eternal opportunities. Let's pray together. So Father, we recognize just the beauty of those words, the Psalms. We ask that you would teach us to number our days. Teach us to recognize that that little hourglass is all too accurate to sometimes what our life is like. Teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. There's wisdom there. Sometimes ignorance is bliss. Sometimes looking the other way. Sometimes pretending like, like, oh, I've got all the time in the world. There's no rush. Man. Until we run out of time. Until the final grains of sand fall. Pray that you would help us to be investing and looking for those opportunities to invest into eternal things, to be investing our time, our talents, our resources into our relationship with you, into our relationship with our neighbors. Man. I recognize that even this message You know, we recorded it so it'll last forever. But it won't. The people, the conversations, and our relationship with you, man, treasures in heaven. Help us to number our days. Help us to be wise stewards of our time and to do it to your glory. Sometimes it's confusing when Jesus says, those who will lose their life will actually gain it. Those who hold on tight to their life are the ones who will lose it. I pray that this week ahead, that we would be wise managers. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.